The theme of today's episode is overlooked story opportunities. You know, and this relates to the act of running a campaign in which the player characters are moving through your world and interacting with, you know, different NPCs or situations. And as GMs, we sometimes neglect the opportunity to think about what that experience is like for the players. You know, and sometimes this can come with the lack of time to prepare, the desire to keep things moving, or our excitement that our players are going to meet with some, you know, NPC that we've planned out. But you know, you don't want to miss opportunities to make your world seem more compelling and more real. So in this example, I'm going to use a seemingly mundane activity, the players approaching a city by land, to demonstrate how rich this activity can be if you think about what are the players seeing and hearing and who or what might be there to greet them. Hello again, gang. K.R. King here, helping one and all homebrew their own D&D campaign. So, typically in D&D, there are two ways to approach a city, either by land or sea. It's conceivable to enter a city by air, but that's a sort of rarefied uh, sort of form of travel. Uh, also, in terms of sea travel, which is very common, I'm going to cover that in another video. Today, I'm just going to talk about entering a city by land. So when a group of characters approaches a settlement by land, whether on foot or using animals, uh, what they see uh, depends on, first of all, the terrain, but also the size and nature of that settlement. If the players are in a desert, they'll probably see the settlement from a long ways away. If they're traveling through, you know, heavy forests, let's say, uh, you know, an elven village, they might not even see it, unless the elves come to investigate to find out, you know, who's wandering by. So for this example, I'm going to use a classic of D&D. It is a walled city on a clear coastal hex. So why are so many cities on the coast? Of course, it is because goods and people can easily be transported to this city by sea. And you have fishing fleets which go out to get, you know, food or more trade supplies. And why does any self-respecting D&D city have walls? Well, to protect its inhabitants from attack. You know, and these walls are a focal point of the city. They're the first thing you see as you approach. They tell you something about the size of the city, the wealth of the city, you know, how much, how often they are attacked and, you know, what sort of defenses they put up. So you'd think huge stone walls would indicate a very rich city, whereas, you know, a crude fence is made out of logs, you're probably in a rustic village setting. You know, and the maintenance and vigilance of city walls are very important. You need to control who goes in and out of the city through its gates. You know, in theory, you could have an attacking force send an advance team into the city to, you know, open up uh, the gates or uh, punch holes or, you know, disable, uh, you know, ballistae or something. And you don't want any kind of tunnels underneath your walls for the same reason. But you know, another thing is in medieval times, commerce was very tightly controlled by the authorities. You had to have permission to enter the city and sell your goods in the central market square. This usually involved paying some kind of tax or bribing city officials, but also you could fall out of favor and lose your license. But the thing is, merchants that didn't have, you know, this ticket to sell in the market square would sometimes gather outside the city walls you know, to take advantage of travelers and merchants coming in and out of the city. Sometimes they were selling goods to come up with a fee to pay uh, for this, you know, ticket to sell inside or simply taking advantage of the fact that people were out here. And so what happens when you have a walled city like this and people start gathering on the outside that are either denied entrance or just choose not to go inside, you get a whole community of people outside the city walls. And this is something we forget about. We tend to say, okay, you go to the city, you go to the guard, and they let you in. Well, what's out there? What's going on out there? And this is an area rich for all sorts of story opportunities. So what you want to think about is who would be on the outskirts, you know, outside the walls of the city? How would they organize themselves? You know, and what does the city think about this? So I'm going to talk about one just general outskirt NPC, and then two large-scale groups that tend to congregate outside of city walls. You know, so the most general, you know, outskirt of the city NPC are farmers. They're ubiquitous to the world of D&D, you know, medieval times in general. You might decide that these are, you know, landless serfs or peasants 
who work the fields uh, under a king or nobles. They might live in the shanty town outside or in you know, sort of crude huts. But you know, you can also have farmers who own their own land and thereby have uh, better dwellings. Now, in the early days of D&D, we tended to have, you know, this sort of peasant or serfs. Uh, we tried to recreate a feudal system based on history. But still, the thing about that is that then you have these farmers that are sort of kind of, you know, one level above slaves, sort of like, you know, the sharecroppers of the American South or the factory workers who lived in factory towns of the robber barons. And it's kind of depressing. You know, and since that time, you know, in recent years, I thought to myself, you know what, I'm creating a fantasy world. Why should I have people, you know, living wretched lives under a wretched political system? Why not have independent farmers who own their land, who have some pride? You could have a, you know, an evil king or nobles who have enslaved people, but this is a story opportunity for your players to free them or, you know, alleviate the situation. So I'm going to stick with the fantasy of the independent yeoman farmer. So I talked in an earlier video about creating a village map and I talked about you know, the size of farms, how many people per acre, this sort of thing to try to populate uh, a typical village or typical farms. So you can look at that video if you want to have, you know, accurate numbers of how many farmers would be out there supporting the city of whatever population lives inside the walls. But the issue here is how are your players going to interact with farmers as they make their way into the city? You know, farmers talk to one another about events of the day or things that are happening outside the city. They go into the city to sell their, you know, wares in the market square. They can provide the players with all sorts of rumors of, you know, war or strife or whatever. So the technique here is to describe the farmland along the road as the players make their way. Uh, describe farmers that are working either alone or in groups, you know, family units, and see how the players react. If they're not interested, if they just kind of go, oh, whatever, they can just move on by. You know, you don't have to telegraph any encounters. The idea at this basic level is you're just giving them a sense, here's a real world with people, you know, going about their business in that real world. And remember also that farmers most of the time are either too busy or too cautious to talk to random travelers. But if you want to create a storyline, you can have some incident occur with a farmer or group of farmers as the players pass by. Perhaps a farmer's just had something stolen. Uh, perhaps they have an injured family member they're taking to town from said encounter. You know, he describes that his farm is under night attacks or something is occurring continually, something to get the players possibly interested. You know, and if the players ignore it, you just move on. But if they're interested, you can then plug in some preset encounter that you have. So I'm gonna use this, you know, in a future video, I have this example of a farmer digging a well who has broken through to an underground chamber. It's a really fun adventure, so look for that. And here's a GM pro tip. Always protect your farmers from mischief by the players. Because farmers provide the food that keeps a city alive and potentially they also provide a militia in times of war. So the rulers of a city and the town's guardsmen have a vested interest in protecting farmers. They will not look kindly on anyone who's assaulting them or interfering in their work. All right, so that's just the general sort of outskirts of town dweller. Now we have two, you know, I'm going to talk about two large scale groups. I'm going to talk about the refugee camp and the shanty town. And the reason that I have a refugee camp as separated from a shanty town, even though, you know, visually they may look similar, is that the residents of a refugee camp are, have separated themselves from everyone else. They either for political reasons or you know, some disaster, they're on the run from a, a war or a famine or a plague. And also the residents of a shanty town may separate themselves from a refugee camp because they don't want trouble. Because if this group that's in the refugee camp are on the run, somebody might be after them and also the city may be interested in keeping them outside. They're too much trouble. And again, unlike a shanty town which gathers over time, you have a situation where a group of people either came all together or very in a very short period of time and they have a unity of population. So the refugee camp has a temporary nature about it. In theory, uh, the people there will leave once the war or famine is over. But also there's a political aspect to this. And often in a refugee camp, you have very strong political leadership here. And these leaders, you know, they may want to gain entry to the city. They're like, we don't want to go back. We want to get into the city. 
you know, they might want to, you know, get a force to go back to where they came from, perhaps if there's an overthrown or, you know, minority or something to, you know, wreak vengeance. You know, or someone to just cure the plague so that they can go back to where they live. They want to go home. So this sort of leadership and these sort of problems are excellent story opportunities for your players. And in addition, the city may be sending spies in the refugee camp. You know, there might be spies from the other side if they're fleeing a war. All sorts of interesting intrigue, you know, going on in a refugee camp. But of course, the most classic example of a large-scale group living outside a city is the shantytown. You know, and we always think here of very crude dwellings, open sewers, and all sorts of very dangerous people. If you have a player in your group that is of the urchin background, very obvious uh, idea that they might be from this shantytown, which gives the player characters access to all sorts of the denizens of this place. So I always think about if I'm going to create a shantytown is where is its location, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the main gate, but also the walls of the city. Because it should be close enough for the various gangs of, you know, pickpockets and thieves to mingle among the merchants and travelers outside the main gates, steal from them, and then escape, you know, into the, you know, narrow alleys and whatnot uh, of the shantytown. But it isn't going to be right next to the gates or even near the walls because the city guard won't allow this. They don't want them directly harassing the, you know, upright merchants and whatnot. And also, they don't want to near the walls because then they can dig tunnels underneath. Oh, and I'll talk about that whole thing later when we get into designing one. So I usually put my shanty town somewhere where there's water. You know, if you have a river flowing by, they might be there, but oftentimes that is prime agricultural ground. So as I mentioned, a drainage ditch, which is, you know, depressing, but maybe realistic, or a swampy area where people don't want to be. So when you think about the citizens of a shanty town, the criminal element always comes to mind. And the interaction with the players oftentimes is negative. You have thieves or pickpockets that steal something from the players when they're going towards the city and they follow them into the shantytown. But as I said, if you've got someone with a urchin uh, or a criminal background or, you know, charlatan or whatever, they might have, you know, access or friends within this shantytown to give the players access. And, you know, it's not all just criminals that live in a shantytown. You can have people on the run hiding out there. You know, they can be from someone within the city itself or from another city or NPC. You know, humanoids of many different types are going to be found in a shantytown. But, you know, you also have, you know, itinerant, you know, individuals who would live in a shantytown by choice. Musicians, fortune tellers, traveling theatrical troops, tradespeople that don't have access, can't afford to pay to sell their wares within the town square or don't want to sell their wares within the town square under the watchful eye of the city guard. Again, the story opportunities with a shantytown are limitless. And at the other end, you could have the upright citizen, you know, the cleric that has a temple for the poor there. And the thing is, this shantytown is a community. It will have all sorts of businesses and whatnot that we associate with a more formal town. You're always going to have crude taverns and whatnot, which the players can enter at their own risk. But, you know, these kind of places are really good story opportunities. All sorts of rumors, all sorts of information, all sorts of gossip on what really happens on the other side of the city walls. You know, and you have operatives from the city, whether from the city guard or higher up or powerful NPCs who, you know, work as spies and whatnot in the shanty town to find out what's going on. You know, and a city will allow a shanty town to exist for a number of reasons. One, they can hire people to do various dirty tasks in which if they get caught or whatever, they can just disavow any knowledge of this. You know, there are vices within a shanty town that the more genteel citizenry likes to go out, you know, do a little slumming or whatnot. And when you find leading citizens slumming in a shanty town and the players run into them, this can be really interesting story fodder because they're in a situation where they don't want anyone to know they're there. So that's just an introduction into the many overlooked story opportunities that you have just as players are approaching a city. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to use this dungeon draft software that I've used before. It's a really good economical package, and I'm going to create a shanty town. And the idea here is to, you know, make it seem realistic, you know, with all the weird, uh, you know, roadways and alleys and whatnot. Thinking about the inhabitants, who would live there, what are the various businesses and people. And then talk about when you're building this how the players are going to interact, what they're going to see, what they're going to hear, what they're going to smell. But until then, if you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more. Please leave some comments. I always answer them. And of course, my friends, keep playing D&D &D 
and tell somebody else about it.